All right, uh, Wilson, should I go ahead and get started now? Okay, uh, great. Uh, so everyone, welcome. Um, uh, this is the classic website blunders session for Bad Camp 2020. I'm super happy to be with you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, kind of uh, introduce and set the stage. We'll go through uh, what, what I like to consider uh, 10 classic website blunders. And we'll talk about ways that you can avoid those blunders. And then, um, you know, we think, uh, you know, process is pretty key to uh, uh, avoiding blunders consistently. So we'll talk about some process thoughts and then we'll uh, kind of wrap it up a little bit. So uh, to start off uh, as an intro, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Stephen Pashby. I'm an account manager at Design Hammer. We're a full service website strategy uh, design development firm based in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, we work a lot in Drupal. Uh, I'd say it's about half of what we do. We also work in WordPress and some other frameworks as well. Uh, I've been working in industry for over nine years and uh, I've been involved in dozens of web projects. So I have uh, had a chance to see a lot of uh, projects go well and some that have had some challenges. So uh, I think it gives me a decent perspective on this sort of thing. So I'd like to maybe uh, just ask if folks could maybe uh, post in the chat, uh, you know, kind of who you guys are so I can maybe um, uh, tailor this a little bit. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm wondering if we've got any folks that work at web agencies or creative agencies, uh, any any folks that kind of have their own shingle, uh, or if we have any in-house um, web or uh, admin or marketing staff. Uh, and then also um, within that, kind of what your role is, are you in, you know, project management, accounts, uh, creative, um, you know, are you a developer, a designer? Uh, if you could just kind of uh, toss that in the chat, um, that'd be great. Uh, and, uh, and you know, kind of see who we've got with us today. Um, great. Uh, so we got director of projects. Awesome. Welcome, Tori. Um, so uh, also, uh, you know, just if, uh, you know, I'm assuming most folks here have been involved at least a web project before. Um, but, uh, some folks might have been involved, uh, in multiple website projects and some may be involved in many, many website projects. So, uh, you know, you kind of have a, a different perspective as you kind of go through that. Um, and I'm assuming everyone has been involved in a website project before. And, uh, you know, if you've been involved in one and it went well, that's great. If you've been involved in multiples, you know, they do not always go well. Uh, and sometimes they can be stressful and sometimes projects can even fail. Uh, so some impressive uh, project management statistics. Um, you know, most organizations have a 70% project failure rate. Um, on average, projects go over budget by 27% of their intended cost. Um, and a lot of times uh, uh, budget overrun is the reason for a project failure. And then, you know, aside from that, uh, a lot of times uh, projects fail to meet their intended goals. So even if it's finished on time and on budget, if it doesn't work, it's not really a success. Uh, and then it's really common that projects end up kind of uh, orthogonal to what, uh, what uh, the organization is trying to achieve. Um, and 75% of project managers uh, believe their projects could be slated to fail from the beginning. So that's uh, some pretty sobering statistics, honestly. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is sort of talk about uh, some classic blunders that, uh, that I've seen in my time. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully to give you guys some tools to kind of either um, avoid or at least mitigate uh, some of the blunders uh, so you guys can have smooth, projects going forward um, and plan to do that in the medium of one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. So fair warning, uh, there may be a few spoilers in the talk. Um, 
but the movie's been out for 30 years. So I hope that you'll forgive me uh, if you have not seen the movie before. So should we build a new website? Why not? How hard could it be? So our story will have uh, lots of action. Uh, we'll have fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. But why, why the Princess Bride? Well, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a little bit prophetic, right? Uh, why do you wear a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? Oh, no, it's just that they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. So uh, as we are commonly wearing masks these days, thought it might be appropriate. So let's get into the blunders. Uh, so if, in case you are not familiar with the movie, uh, one of the main characters is... Uh, one of the main villains is Vizzini, the Sicilian, uh, and he references the classic blunders. Uh, and so uh, he says the most famous classic blunder is never get involved in a land war in Asia. And only slightly less known is never go against a Sicilian when death is on the line, which in the movie it is. So in our case, we're going to actually talk about classic blunders revolving websites. So one classic blunder is a lack of a business case. Uh, and uh, you know, if you've seen the movie, you may recognize this scene. Um, I believe he was in Sideways. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you might recognize the scene. Uh, Wesley, the gentleman in the middle, has just woken up from being mostly dead all day. And he is asking, he's trying to orient himself, figure out what's going on. So he's, who are you? Are you enemies? Why am I on this wall? Where's Buttercup, which is a love interest? So, you know, it's really common that you see um, you see a project, and it's it's an interesting project. It's got stuff going on. It's trying to do some things, but it doesn't line up with something that the organization is trying to do uh, organizationally, um, or even worse. It's sort of a, a project in search of an audience, and, you know, because we're usually working with an audience. Um, so it's important to think about, um, you know, is there a real business case for a project, particularly if you've got, uh, you know, if you're working uh, kind of internally and uh, you know, with an organization, it's one of your own organization's project. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll also to kind of reference a different movie uh, we kind of think about it as if you build it, they will come, right? If you build this this amazing website, then um, you know the audience will just materialize, uh, and that's not always the case. So it's really important when you're um, when you're thinking about this to make sure that the project actually has a use case or a business need, because if you don't, you risk wasting a lot of time and money. Um, and if you've got a project that doesn't have a business case, in a lot of ways, it's kind of doomed from the start. So, um, you know, it's it's an important thing as you're sort of defining a project internally to to take a step back from, you know, what you're trying to do and make sure that this makes sense for the organization overall. So uh, an example of uh, uh, this blunder that, uh, that I saw in action uh, was um, uh, we were talking with a uh, with a very, very traditional financial planning firm, you know, and it was, it's very much, uh, you know, you would have a relationship with them, have consultations. They work with uh, high wealth individuals uh, and their the principal of the firm uh, decided that uh, what he really wanted to do was, uh, was have a online subscription video platform for millennials so that he could give them financial advice. Um, you know, and he, this wasn't really a thing that the firm did and they didn't really have uh, uh, the, you know, internal capabilities to do this or even the folks to create the videos. Um, and to give you kind of an idea, uh, the, um, the first video that was hosted and I think the only video that actually was ever produced for this was the uh, the principal of the firm explained to millennials how much they could save by skipping their Starbucks for a year. So 
not surprisingly, that was uh, an instance of a, uh, a project that lacked a business case and did not go anywhere. So let's move on to our next one, unrealistic expectations. Um, and so it's, it's pretty common that, uh, that you know, in our, in our world where we, we're consuming websites all the time, uh, that uh, folks can get an idea of what they would like, a vision, um, but maybe it's a little misaligned by the, to the resources that they have access to, either by what their organization can handle or by what their organization is willing to invest in a given project. So I think this really commonly takes sort of um, two forms. Uh, one is sort of what can we reasonably expect for the resources that, that this project has? Uh, and so some sort of warning signs that this blunder might be, uh, might be happening is, oh, I really like the Apple website. Can you make it look like that? Right, you know the the the, um, the number of zeros that are involved in Apple's marketing efforts are, it's a pretty fair number of zeros, right? And so if there, you're not talking a similar number of zeros, it's maybe uh, the wrong reference point. The other thing that I think commonly can happen is folks have sort of unrealistic expectations by uh, what's a realistic um, degree of success for the project, right? Um, and so another uh, kind of uh, example of this blunder uh, that I've seen uh, was folks that really want to start their own social network. Um, and we've, we've done a few of these and we've seen them succeed and we've seen them fail. Um, and frequently the, the common denominator of whether something is successful or not is, is there something in this social network concept that is going to either provide a space for an existing active community, or um, is there gonna be some sort of really unique compelling content that's going to draw a particular community to it? You know, if neither of these are there, you know, it's really uncommon for, uh, for folks to uh, actually, you know, upend themselves from Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn to go to a new social platform just because an organization they happen to be involved with has this platform. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a classic blunder that we have seen. Um, so really, you wanna make sure when you've got, when you're defining a project, uh, you, know, you never have infinite time and money. So you gotta be reasonable what can be done and what can be achieved. Um, you know, so if, uh, if you're unreasonable, the project may never start, or it may never be completed, or it could just kind of be cut to death with feature creep. Uh, so this is really important when you're kind of defining a project, but uh, you got to kind of keep an eye on it throughout. Uh, the real thing, you know, a project that doesn't finish can't be successful. So uh, it's really important to keep the entire project team um, willing to compromise and kind of have reasonable expectations because stuff's going to come up, things will take longer, right? And, uh, you know, if you've got kind of uh, the, the understanding that, you know, it's more important for the project to get finished than to um, be something that it cannot be, then you'll actually be able to get done at some point, hopefully on budget and schedule. So it's, it's good to look towards similar projects when you're sort of setting your expectations. Insufficient schedule, that is a uh, common blunder. Um, so, you know, basically you gotta allow enough calendar time for a project to be successful. Um, either, you know, if they, if they don't, something might be delivered on schedule and it will not be adequate, or they'll fail if they just can't get it done in time. Um, and you know, really, if you kind of sign on to an insufficient schedule, the project's basically doomed from the start. Um, and you know, you know, the more complex the project is, the, the more this is a thing, right? If you've got integration with third-party systems, if you've got um, you know different pieces that have to work together that all have to be built, like those are things that cannot be very efficiently done in parallel. So they really have to be done sequentially for them to be done somewhat efficiently and effectively. Um, 
so it's it's helpful uh, you know, when thinking about this to kind of take a step back when you're looking at your project schedule and really kind of game plan through the different kind of how the how the project needs to flow, what the different approval stages are, and make sure that you've got uh, that accounted for in the schedule. Because, you know, you can look at a schedule and say, oh, three months, that's that's more than enough time. But when you start to get in there and slice and dice it, you go, oh, man, this key stakeholder that has to approve this, he's going to be in Malaysia for four weeks, right? And, you know, he's going to be hiking or something. He won't actually have uh, the ability to approve stuff. And, and, you know, if you haven't thought through all of those pieces, you know, this the insufficient schedule can not just be calendar. It can also be when in the calendar. So it can be a real issue that way. Uh, so a particularly bad example of this that uh, that uh, uh, that we we kind of sidestepped, thankfully, uh, was uh, a company approached us uh, and they had an important project launch in six weeks, most important thing in the history of the company. Um, it was a new website. It would have an integration with an internal registration system that'd be ready in four weeks. And so they're talking to us six weeks from the launch date and have their registration system ready in four weeks. They need about two weeks to select the firm that they would do this because this is a competitive bidding process. And they would need um, two weeks to test the final candidate. So we decide, we realized that basically at that point, we would have effectively one day to do the project. So we, uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one, Tori. It's starting a three month project in October, usually a red flag. Um, yeah, definitely, because there's there's holidays. That's definitely a thing. Uh, so we basically we we hit the eject button on that project. Um, but shocker, the site did not launch in six weeks. Uh, so another blunder is uh, kind of absent or uninvolved leadership. Um, and this one I think is a little more subtle because you you might think, okay, you know, we've got enough time. We've got enough resources. We've got a, a project that's aligned with what the organization needs to do. Um, but uh, you know, if you've got uh, leadership that just is not involved and they've 100% delegated, that can be a real problem um, because you know it's possible that the the project manager working on the project just is not in tune with the leadership. And so what is finally delivered will be wholesale rejected by the leadership. So, you know, this is this is key kind of through all the different uh, stages of a project because um, you really need to make sure that leadership is appropriately involved, not in the day to day, but appropriately involved to make sure that what is delivered aligns with uh, the organization and what the what the um, what the leadership is trying to do. So uh, an example of, of us seeing this blunder in action uh, was uh, we were working with a client and they had a pretty odd organizational culture where basically there was a single, um, a single person who had the vision of the organization in his head. And he was the only person who could basically say yes or no on things. The problem was he was also, um, according to uh, everyone we talked to at the organization, incapable of sort of generalizing and looking at in-progress work to provide his insight. They would just focus on the details of what wasn't completed yet. Uh, and so we, we said, you know, look, this puts the project at risk. It's very likely to go over budget and over schedule because, you know, we can't be confident that what we finally deliver, even though it, it matches what we have discussed, will meet with what the ultimate stakeholder has in his mind. Um, surprise, uh, when it was finally delivered to the ultimate stakeholder, uh, we ended up having to do two rounds of major revisions at a significant increase of the project cost and schedule. So uh, you know, it's really critical to have the appropriate um, leadership involved you know, from the get-go. Um, kind of related uh, is a junior project manager. Um, so frequently um, organizations will assign, uh, you know, someone who does not have a lot of authority as the project manager for a, for a project. 
um, which, you know, they're thinking, well, these other folks, they have important things to do. So we'll just give it to this person and they'll just kind of get the emails back and forth, make sure that the, the dev team is working. But the problem with the junior project manager is often they don't actually have authority, so they can't actually make decisions. And they may not even have the authority to compel uh, the appropriate um, leadership to make decisions, um, which can just, uh, you know, kind of have a project kind of careen off when a decision needs to be made and the project manager can't make it and can't make someone else make it. Uh, so it's it's pretty critical to make sure that you've got a, uh, you know, your project manager is empowered to either make decisions that the, the organization will accept or to um, make the people who can make those decisions be involved and make the decisions on uh, the approved schedule, right? It's otherwise that project is, it's likely to fail. Uh, so an example, one that we uh, uh, had in this case was we were, we were working on a um, sort of an interesting uh, project. It was uh, a, a Drupal site uh, that uh, it was a migration from uh, from Drupal 6 to 7, uh, and it was a Drupal site that was used to uh, effectively collect survey data. And uh, the previous developer who developed the, the first version had done some non-standard things to uh, web forms. Um, so it's uh, it, it was an instance of, you know, we spent a pretty fair amount of time digging into the many different web forms that were used to collect this data. But as we got into it, we learned that there were many more undocumented modifications. And the only real instance of knowing about this stuff was all of this web form data that would not come over cleanly into the, to the Drupal 7 version where we were not hacking web form to pieces. Um, and uh, basically the, the junior project manager kind of dug in his heels and said, uh, no, it has to come in. It has to come in. Uh, eventually, when we got the, uh, the uh, president of organization involved, uh, she said, we don't need all this old data. Why, why did you think that we needed all this old data? So this is a, an instance of the, the junior project manager who did not go and ask and say, hey, there are problems. We've learned new things. Can we change course? So that's a, a real issue with kind of a, having that junior project manager involved. So another uh, major blunder. I mean, this is this is probably one of one of the big ones, other than uh, lack of business cases, failure of communication. Um, so you know, it it's important throughout a project to have uh, open lines of communication and. To make sure things aren't missed, you want to have a kind of a regular cadence, and you want to document decisions as they're made. Because uh, anytime that folks are like going without communication or making a lot of assumptions about what one person says versus what the other person hears, um, you know, there's a good chance misunderstandings creep in, which can result in need for rework, um, things being delivered that aren't uh, in alignment. Uh, so you know, it's really critical throughout the entire project to make sure you've got adequate documentation. Um, and that can provide the reminders of why decisions were made and when they were made. Um, so, you know, meeting notes being circulated and approved, um, uh, documented specifications, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so an example of uh, one of these situations that, that, uh, that we saw uh, was um, you know, we will sometimes work with uh, other agencies. And so we we're, we we're doing some development work for a creative agency. Uh, and, um, you know, as we we're talking with our, with our client there and, and the end client on it, um, we were getting the feeling that there was some misalignment between the scope that we'd been told and that we had uh, agreed to and what the end client was asking for. Um, so as we worked through the project, that became more and more clear. And eventually, uh, everyone got around the table and was able to uh, understand that what the end client wanted was roughly uh, twice as complex as what uh, we had uh, been contracted to provide. And this was an instance where um, there were two big issues 
one, uh, the, the, the other contract was not sufficiently clear. There were a lot of ambiguities there. And two, the places where uh, the, the project manager attempted to uh, course correct back to what uh, our client thought the scope was, um, were not uh, documented. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, they ended up having to eat um, about twice as much work. Uh, so that's a, a, a pretty significant issue if you don't uh, have appropriate documentation. Uh, so another real issue is sort of design by committee. Um, so basically, if you have too many people involved, uh, nothing ever gets decided or there's no clear decision. So um, you, know, you can commonly have uh, projects that uh, are very expensive, very late, everyone has had input and no one's happy. Um, so it's it's ideal when you're when you're doing this to kind of rely on a small group of decision makers who can make decisions, then have the authority to make those decisions. So we were working with a uh, with a, a large NGO on a UI redesign, and uh, they had an 18 person committee uh, representing all the different business units uh, involved in the design process. So project it was just the just the design phase project was expected to take four to six weeks, required nine stages of revisions, um, and it took weeks to convene the, the entire 18-person committee due to its size. So end up running six months behind schedule, and at the end, no one was really happy with the results. So, you know, design by committee can be a, a pretty significant blunder. Uh, for smaller organizations, a very common blunder is the vanishing volunteers. Um, so a lot of times when you've got a smaller organization, uh, they might say, uh, you know what, we don't have a lot of money. Hey, we got this volunteer that's working with us. They can, uh, they can do this, um, which can be great uh, until the volunteer's not there anymore. Um, so uh, it can be a problem either if the volunteer gets in over their head and they're just like, well, here is your unfinished project. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, they're out. Or they could say, well, here's a finished project. And uh, you guys have fun maintaining that. So we've seen that uh, kind of in a few different ways. Um, one, uh, with a volunteer who basically was just unable to complete something. Uh, or more commonly, uh, they've delivered something and there are non-obvious problems that then become uh worse as the site lives and kind of goes about its business. Um, and then another place that this often comes into place is uh, volunteers, uh, since they're working for free, they usually get a, a, a lot of control over what technology choices they make. So uh, they might be working in like, hey, here's this thing I want to learn. I will do it for this volunteer project. And, you know, it's a you know content management system that three people in the world use. And then, you know, once they hand it off and, and walk away, now the, the organization is left with a project that they can't support and they don't, they can't even really find someone who does this. Um, so that's a, that is a, a major volunteer. And if you, if you like that one, you'll love the next blunder, blunder blinded by buzzwords. Um, so this is, I think, being distracted from the core goals of a project by like the latest fad or bleeding edge technology. Um, you know, that's not saying you can't use bleeding edge and that there's not reasons to do that. You know, you might say, you know, we, this is a due to our budget cycle or whatever. This is a project that it's a major project. We want it to be, a, you know, have architecture for as good, uh, for as long a runway as possible. So then, you know, maybe you, you invest some extra upfront to, to make something work. But you know, you know, I you know, in the in the in the Drupal space, how many Drupal sites actually need to be headless Drupal sites, right? It's it's not that common. You know, sometimes you've got performance, you got very specific UI stuff you want to work on. That's great, but not every uh, mom and pop Drupal site needs that. Um, and so uh, you know, we've uh, we've seen that um, in kind of a couple of different cases. Um, you know, one we've seen uh, we've seen uh, 
platforms being selected um, either because they're the new thing or because this is what an organization kind of knows um, rather than uh, being selected because it's a good fit for, you know, the resources that are allocated to the project and what the project's trying to do. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the things that we've been asked to do with Drupal over the years that we have done, um, some of them could have been done much more efficiently uh, in another platform. Because you know, Drupal's good at what it's good at. There are other things maybe less good at. Um, I've also seen it where uh, companies like, you know, hey, we have a particular, you know, we're a reseller for this. We need to use this hosting. Like that hosting doesn't really work with the platform we're developing in, but it's got to happen. So, you know, that's a place where you're going to invest a lot of extra resources doing something for very minimal uh, gain and maybe even limit uh, the features that can be done. Um, so another, I think probably a key one is ignoring risks. Um, you know, every project has risks, right? It can be uh, due to, um, you know, budget, timeline, stakeholder involvement, uh, unknown technical implementation, um, everything's got risks and that's, that's fine. That's part of the business, right? But, you know, if you can, if you take time to uh, identify risk uh, and then put some potential mitigation plans in place, then, you know, when something goes wrong, you're not back on your heels trying to figure it out. You're like, okay, we've talked about this. We know what our game plan is. This is how, uh, this is how we can kind of roll forward with this. So, you know, there are a lot of different risks and a lot of these blunders, you know, sometimes, sometimes you do have uninvolved leadership. You know, sometimes you do have to have a very large design group involved. Sometimes you do have to work with a non-ideal technology for the project, right? But by calling those out as risks, you're able to say, okay, we know that this is a risk. And then we know that we can now have a conversation around what are we going to do if this risk becomes a problem? So um, two risks that I see almost all the time are uh, sort of uh, either integrations with undefined or in development systems or um, really aggressive timelines for complex projects and an unwillingness to um, define a constrained minimum feature set to get it out the door. Like those are two serious risks that, uh, you know, you may be in a situation where you've got to do one of those, but you don't want to ignore it and just kind of stick your fingers in your ear and say, it's not going to be a problem. Say, talk about it forthrightly. This is a problem or a risk. And then what do we do if this becomes a problem? So we've talked about some blunders. Uh, let's talk about how we can avoid these blunders. So really, um, we have a couple different things. Uh, we want to make sure that a project aligns with your organizational goals. Uh, we want to make sure that expectations kind of fit with what resources are out there. Need to involve stakeholders uh, for input, feedback, and approval. Um, get potential users to uh, help you uh, determine what to do through surveys and user testing. And then follow an appropriate process that's got you know, a good method for communication, feedback, and approvals in place so that, you know, when you get, in, when you're in the thick of it, you actually have a process in place to get stuff done. So uh, aligning with your organizational goals, uh, one of a, one of the great quotes from Princess Bride, uh, you know, I like to think about a project as there's maybe kind of three classes of projects that organizations do. So one is, you know, ones that line up directly with the organization's core focus. You know, what are your values? What are you trying to do? This is key. Another one is sort of a discrete tactical initiative. Maybe that's a, a subsite or something that a, a department does. Uh, and then another one is, you know, maybe a VP or a director or something. They, they, they are just really interested in doing this thing. They've got some resources for. It. That's maybe more of a vanity project or a boondoggle. Right, um, you know, if you kind of understand how a project fits in with the organizational goals, it helps frame the rest of uh, of how you approach it, you know, for good or ill. So once you've got that framed, you want to sort of match your expectations with resources. All right, so you want to make sure, like, 
you understand what you've got to work with, and then and within that, do something that you can achieve. Um, so you, you, know, you think about the difference between something that's like a core organizational project that's going to have, you know, for that organization, a lot of resources to, you know, a department level project that's maybe, yeah, this is, we should really think of this more as a proof of concept, you know, because we're, we're kind of building this with, uh, you know, chewing gum and bailing wire. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you, if you're not investing Apple level resources, should you really be expecting uh, Apple levels of polish? You know, in the words of the Princess Bride, get used to disappointment. So you also want to make sure that you've got stakeholders involved, right? Uh, you know, from the beginning. So uh, that's uh, that's an important piece there, right? So you can kind of think about different times when you might want stakeholders involved. So when you're determining technical requirements, when you're talking about information architecture, because there's some potential political considerations there, as well as user uh, considerations, design, definitely, uh, user acceptance testing, uh, and then final sign-off. Uh, and so this doesn't have to be the same stakeholders at each given stage, but you know, if, you've, if you've already sort of teed up the right people at the right time, you, know, you can keep your project on schedule and minimize costly rework. So user surveys and testing. Um, yeah, I just thought this was a great quote for that. Uh, um, you know, ultimately, uh, a site's going to be successful or not based on how users interact with it. So, you know, if you don't talk to users through some user survey or testing methodologies, you might end up uh, with something that's organized exactly like um, an organization's internal political structure and not in a way that uh, users actually can understand and uh, and interact with. Um, so by actually spending time in discovery and planning to engage users, uh, you can help head that off. Uh, and so, you know, some common uh, user testing tools are user surveys, you know, ask users, what do they want? Um, have users participate in card sorts or tree testing to, um, you know, figure out how the content the site's gonna have should be organized. Uh, and then also, um, you know, if you've got sort of a complex uh, user interface, like maybe you've got more of a web app situation, you know, uh, taking some time for some usability testing, either during design or, um, you know, doing some early mockups or something, that can really help uh, polish off some rough edges. Uh, and then following an appropriate process is key. Um, so, you know, if you have you follow the wrong process for your project, you can end up in a bad situation, right? Um, so, you know, we we find that uh, having a document process is it's really key because that way we know, okay, at this stage, we know we need to have these approvals, and we're not going to move ahead until we've got those. And so that means that if there's an issue later, uh, it's a good call on accessibility testing as well, and, and to kind of uh, uh, Ashley uh, posted uh, not only thinking about usability testing, but also thinking about accessibility testing. Uh, and you know, it's important when if you're you know if you're going to make an accessible site to make sure you know during discovery and planning that you identify the appropriate standard for that organization, um, and then even before that, that you identify appropriate like as the project is being composed, you make sure that the uh, the, the organization is willing to invest the the organizational resources in that because that may involve creating new content, um, any number of things. So it's a, it's an important thing to to talk about early because uh, it's going to steer a lot of the rest of the decisions. Um, but uh, following an appropriate process can help you minimize kind of backtracking. Uh, so that's pretty key. So I'm going to just kind of push through the last uh, couple of slides quickly so we can. Uh, have some time for a few quick questions. So we really think about the process in kind of four stages. There's sort of project definition and resourcing, discovery and planning, production, and then post-launch. So for project definition and resourcing, you gotta kind of say, what are we trying to do and what do we have to work with? So you wanna be able to speak positively to what an organization is doing and why, uh, who's gonna be involved, what resources, calendar, budget, or staff time are going to be used, and if you're going to hire um, 
outside resources, you need to make that decision at this point. Uh, then there's discovery and planning. So, you know, let's figure out now that we've defined the project, how are we going to do it? Uh, and so you want to document project goals, audiences, metrics of success, um, determine content strategy and organization, identify specific technology implementations. Um, you know, are you using Drupal, are you using WordPress, you know, are you using Square? Um, and then, uh, you know, go into production, right? And you got to give yourself time to do it right in the production process. So that includes your design process, development, content migration, and testing, right? And if you've got, you know, for example, if you're doing accessibility, you got to make sure that uh, once you've got your content migrated, that you're actually doing appropriate accessibility testing of the actual content, not the, just the design. So there's a lot of different pieces there, right? Um, and then post-launch, you know, once the site's launched, what do you do? So you want to make sure you've got uh, a process in place for ongoing maintenance, Content updates, new feature development, right? Is that something you're going to handle internally? You're going to work with a vendor on sort of an ad hoc basis, a retainer, any number of things. But you want to kind of have a process in place for the entire the entire life cycle of the project. So, um, you know, in conclusion, use process, avoid blunders that uh, do a project from the start, and then you know try to mitigate the effect of blunders that could potentially kill a successful project. Thank you, BadCap2020. And uh, I've got, I'll hold this up here for a second while I take some questions and then move on to the sponsor slide next. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And I'll be glad to answer them in the four minutes we have left. It's odd. I, I wish that the uh, I wish that Hopin actually had a little uh, dot 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 to indicate someone was typing. Um, so that's a that's a good question. Uh, we do. Uh, so the question is, how much formal documentation of the early discovery do we do? Um, it depends on the project. Uh, we usually think about a given project. We want to spend about twenty percent of the project budget on discovery and planning, and that's kind of handles both the discovery and then also implementation planning. Um, we'll usually uh, do it kind of in some stages. So we'll start off with sort of that strategic alignment step with uh, some some pretty targeted, a few page briefs uh, that sort of identify the goals and the audiences. Uh, and then as we do user testing, we'll kind of build out additional information. And then we'll usually culminate our, um, our uh, plan, our discovery and planning project um, to uh, to basically allow us to uh, wrap all of the discovery pieces into one document that then has the planning technical pieces of how we're actually going to do what we've decided to do based on the on the discovery. So that ends up being like a twenty to fifty page document in some cases, um, but it provides a really good roadmap for the the project build out. Another question: Do you have a do you think having good standards helps avoid a lot of blunders? Are they subject to the same issues of too many people involved, et cetera? Um, so I think it depends a little bit. Uh, from a design perspective, if you've got uh, if you've got good design standards handy, um, you know you'll you'll commonly be able to stick within those guardrails pretty easily. If it's a little more green field, then if you have a lot of different people, you can have a lot of conflicting visions. Um, let's see. That's, I think that's mostly it. Um, uh, let's see, uh, another question. Are there any common DevOps blunders that clients end up committing? Big one, I think, is not making a plan to keep their uh, their platform up to date. I just see that so often. And then, you know, that's a that's a silly blunder, right? Why don't you have a plan to keep your, your Drupal core uh, up to date? Um, I think we got time for one last one. Um, 
given the remote world and maybe even before, what's your approach of remote user testing platforms versus in-person? Uh, so we uh, have been using um, uh, Optimal Workshop uh, for um, card sorting and tree testing for years, really happy with it. Um, I think that uh, if you're doing kind of more classical user testing, um, you maybe get a little bit more from in-person than uh, card sorting, but uh, for like card sorting or tree testing, um, that I think I think remote platforms are really good. So that puts us at 145. So I think that is time. Thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, if you've got other questions, uh, I'm on Slack. Uh, just go ahead and uh, you know DM me. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it.